Okay guys, we're going to learn three new things today. We're going to learn how to write numbers in scientific notation. We're going to learn the difference between accuracy and precision. And we're going to learn how to count significant figures. So let's go ahead and dive into scientific notation. The reason we want to learn scientific notation is because it's used to help reduce the number of zeros in very large and very small numbers. Now, first things first, we're going to go ahead and write our steps. These do not, you do not have blanks for these steps in your notes, so you need to jot them down to the right side of your notes. Number one, place the new decimal to the right of the first non-zero number. And these steps may not make sense right now, but we're going to use them in just a moment when we practice, so it's important that you write them down so that you can see them as we practice. The second step is to count the jumps from the new decimal to the old decimal. The third step is to write the new number with times 10 after it. The times 10 represents powers, the powers of 10. Every decimal place that you move, you're moving a power of 10. And so if you move three decimal places, you're moving times 10 to the third power. And then number four, you're going to add your exponent. So make sure if you need to, pause the tape at this time and make sure you get all four of these written so that you can use them during our practice. Okay, now let's go ahead and work on some examples and some practice problems. I put up the original number here that we're used to seeing along with the answer already written in scientific notation. So here's the original number and then your answer in scientific notation is on this side. Now, let's go ahead and go through the steps with these. The steps that you had previously written down. The very first step is to make the new decimal or to place the new decimal. The new decimal is always to the right of the first non-zero number. So let's go over here and let's place our new decimal. That's where our new decimal is going to be. Then we need to count from our new decimal to our old decimal. Well, we don't see an old decimal in here, so let's go ahead and place it. Remember, if you don't have a decimal, then your decimal always goes to the far right. So if you don't see a decimal, your old one's always going to be to the far right of the number. So there's our old decimal. So let's count from our new decimal to our old decimal. One, two, three, four, five, and six. So this has six jumps, okay? Now, the six jumps, the number of jumps tells us what our exponent is going to be, with, you know, which power of ten we're going to. And so this one's going to be times ten to the six. Now, how do we know if that six is positive or negative? A lot of you will remember a number line that you used probably in earlier grades math. And right in the middle of the number line, we have a zero. And on the right-hand side of the number line, we have positive numbers. And on the left-hand side of the number line, we have negative numbers. And so this will help you to determine if your exponent is going to be positive or negative. So we know we have six jumps. And we moved to the right, going from the new decimal to the old decimal. That means we moved right on the number line, so we have a positive 6. And you don't have to put the positive sign. It just knows over here that 10 to the 6 is a positive 6. Let's go ahead and move to our second example. Our second example is a very small number, and we want to reduce the amount of zeros. So let's go ahead and figure out how to do the scientific notation for this number. The first step is to place your new decimal. And your new decimal goes to the right of the first non-zero number. So let's go ahead and place that. And then our old decimal, and this one is already here, so we don't have to place it. So we count, our second step is counting from new decimal to old decimal. So we say one, two, three, four, five, six places. So this one also has six jumps. And the third step is always to write your new number. Your new number is just the first non-zero number, the decimal place, and then the numbers that come after it. You can write all of the numbers, or you can go ahead and round it off if you would like to, um, to two decimal places is fine. So we need to determine we write our new number with our power of 10, and then we have to write our exponent. We know our number is going to be 6, and since we move from our new decimal to the old decimal, we move to the left. On the left of our number line, we have negative numbers. So whenever we move left, we're going to have negative, and that's why we have the negative 6 over here. Our third example, this is a very large number, so that's why we want to use scientific notation. We place our new decimal, and we place our old one because the old one is not here, and it's not given to us. And it's always, remember, if we don't see it, it's always at the very far right. And then we count our jumps. One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, 
8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So that means we have 12 jumps. And we moved right on the number line. So that means that our exponent over here is going to be a positive 12. So our new number is 4.5 times 10 to the 12th power. Our last example is a very small number. So again, we start with our first step. We write our first, we write our new decimal, I'm sorry. We write our new decimal. Our old decimal is already here for us, thankfully. And we start counting with our new decimal. And we count our jumps. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. So this one also has 12 jumps. However, we went to the left counting. So that means that our exponent over here is going to be a negative 12. So it's 6.89 times 10 to the negative 12. So this is going to be your practice problems for 1, 2, 3, and 4 in your notes. And what I would like you to do is I would like you to go ahead and write these down. And I want you to pause the tape. When you finish writing all of these into putting them into scientific notation, then you can start the tape again and check your answers. Alright, here are the answers. Your first one should have been 8.95 times 10 to the negative 8. Number 2 should have been 6.789 times 10 to the third power. Number 3 should have been 4.32 times 10 to the negative 3. And number 4 should have been, now you do not have to put all these numbers. You could have stopped it at 1.09. You could have put 1.1 times 10 to the 7th if you wanted to round it, but you do not have to put all of those numbers. So if you had put 1.1 or 1.09, any of that would be fine, times 10 to the 7th. There's one more thing we want to learn is in regards to scientific notation, and that's how to calculate numbers if they're in scientific notation. So for multiplying, if you're multiplying two numbers that are in scientific notation, then you will add the powers of 10. When you're dividing two numbers that are in scientific notation, you're going to subtract the powers of 10. And we're going to do two problems together, and then you're going to do two problems on your own. Now, the very first example that we're going to look at is 1.3 times 10 squared times 7.3 times 10 to the fifth. What you do first is you look at your numbers that they won't multiply, and you multiply those first in your calculator. And what you're going to get is 9.49. Okay, so 9.49. Then the next thing you do, since we're multiplying, since we're multiplying, you're going to add the powers of 10. And these, I'm going to circle the powers of 10 for us so that we make sure that we remember what they are. These are the powers of 10. So you say 5 plus 2 equals 7, and that gives me my new power of 10. So your answer should have been 9.49 times 10 to the 7th. And it's because you added the powers of 10 together because you're multiplying. Now let's look at a division problem. Again, the first thing you do is you're going to divide the numbers that they have for you, just the numbers. So you would, in your calculator, put 7.7 .7 divided by 6.43. And then you're going to end up getting 1.2. And I think I rounded that, so maybe 1.2 and some change. So you have 1.2. The next thing you need to do is you need to work with exponents, because we, we know if our problem is in scientific notation, we know our answer will be in scientific notation. So it's got to be times 10 to some power. And we've got to figure out what power that is. So we look at our exponents, 9 and 3. And with division, we subtract them. So you say 9 minus 3 is 6. So it's going to be, your answer is going to be 1.2 times 10 to the 6th power. Now it's time for you to practice a little bit on your own. You have two to practice by yourself. So go ahead and work these out on your notes where you have the practice problems listed. It says number 1 and 2, so you'll have to copy the problems down. And then pause the tape until you get them calculated. Resume the tape to then get the answers. All right, let's go ahead and
and look at the answer to practice problem number one. Practice problem number one is going to be 3.11 times 10 to the seventh power. Practice problem number two's answer should be 2.25 times 10 to the second power. And if you have any questions about these, remember to jot them down on the left-hand side of your notes so you remember to ask us tomorrow in class. Now, let's go ahead and talk about precision and accuracy and find out the difference between those two things. Now, the first, we're going to use dartboards to explain this principle. The very first dartboard on the left is representing low accuracy but high precision. Because see, accuracy is determined by how close to the true value you are. When you're throwing darts, the true value is the bullseye. You're trying to get to the bullseye. So you have low accuracy. The darts are not close to the bullseye. However, you have high precision because all of the values are very close together. So all of the darts are very close together, so that gives you high precision. So the, the person who threw these darts were not accurate, but they were very precise because they kept hitting the same area. The middle dart board represents high accuracy and low pre precision. Do you see how most of the darts are really close to the bullseye, but none of the darts are really close to one another? So that gives us high accuracy, low precision. The last dart board on the right, you see, is going to represent high accuracy and high precision because they're all very close to the bullseye and they're all very close to one another. Now what I would like you to do is you have some space next to your dartboards. I would like you to draw a target that would represent low accuracy and low precision. Tomorrow when you get to class, we'll check those out and see what they look like. Now let's go ahead and define accuracy. Accuracy is how close a measurement is to the true value. And we talked about that, how close you are to the bullseye. Precision. Precision can mean, it means the same thing, but it can be looked at in two different ways. The first way is how exact a measurement is. So the further past the decimal place you go in a number, the more precise you are because you're being more exact. It can also represent when values are very close together. If you have the same va or values that are very close together but they're not accurate, they're still precise because they are in the same range together. Let's do some practice questions. If the width of this classroom is 10.3 meters, which one would be more accurate? Is it 10 meters or is it 13 meters? Ten meters is the correct answer, because if the classroom measured 10.3 meters, 10 meters is closest to the true value. What about this? Which one of these is a more precise measurement? 4.1 from a tape measure or 4.15 from a tape measure? 4.15 meters is the most precise measurement because it is the most exact. Remember, the farther you go past the decimal place, the more exact you are. Now let's go to the last thing we're going to learn today, which is counting significant figures. The way we're going to learn how to count significant figures is that your number is in here in the United States, is represented by the United States. This is where your number would be. And we're either going to start counting significant figures on the Pacific side of the USA or on the Atlantic side of the USA. But whichever side you start counting on, you have to cross over the entire United States to get to the other ocean before you finish. Now what I just said might sound a little crazy, so let me go ahead and explain. When I talk about the Pacific Ocean, I mean if you have a number and the decimal is present, we use the P in present to stand for Pacific Ocean, to remind us to start counting on the left side of the number and you start with the very first number other than zero and count all the way right across the USA until you get to the end. So pretend when you looked at that map earlier, the USA is your number and then you have Pacific Ocean on, one, on the left hand side, Atlantic Ocean on the right hand side and whether you have a decimal or not tells you which side of the number to start counting on. So when you 
has a number and your decimal is absent, meaning you can't see it. So when the decimal is present, that means you can actually see the decimal in the number it's already given to you. When the decimal is absent and it's not there, that A stands for Atlantic Ocean, meaning you start with the farthest number on the right other than zero and move all the way left across the USA and count the numbers until you run out. The first example that we have is 7.006. Now, this decimal is present. We see it. So that means that we start on the Pacific side of the number. We start on this side, on the left-hand side. We start counting with the first non-zero, and we never stop until we finish. So we say 1. I'm sorry, let me get my pen on. We say 1. Two, three, four. So this number has four significant figures. Let's look at number two. Two is three thousand two hundred. I'm sorry, three thousand and twenty-three. There is no decimal here. That means the decimal is absent. We have to start on the Atlantic Ocean side of the number, which is the right side. And so we're going to start counting with the first non-zero number. So we say 1, 2, 3, 4. So this number also has four significant figures. Let's go ahead and look at our third example, 0 0.35. This has the decimal place. That means the decimal is present. We can see it. Just like if you're present or absent in class, if you're present, I can see you as a teacher. If you're absent, I can't see you. So that's how we work the decimals also. So we have the decimals present in this number. So that means we start on the Pacific side of the, the, the Pacific Ocean side of the number. And we start counting with the first non-zero. So we're going to have um, 3 is the first one that we can count. So we have 1, 2. And so number three has two significant figures. Now let's go ahead and look at number four, which is 90. 90 has the, the decimal is absent. We don't see it anywhere. So 90 has the decimal absent, so we start on the Atlantic Ocean side of the number. We start counting with the first non-zero number, so that means we skip the zero, count the nine, and this has one significant figure. So this is how we count significant figures, and I would like you to do some on your own as practice. Go ahead and these are already written in your notes for you, so just determine the number of significant figures, pause the tape, and then resume the tape once you're ready to check your answers. you got most, if not all, of those correct. If you have some that have questions, just make sure that you star them and we can talk about them when you get to class tomorrow. Now, there's one more thing about significant figures that we need to discuss, and this is what you do when you have a mathematical problem. Anytime you answer a mathematical problem, you need to answer in the same number of significant figures as the part of your mathematical problem with the fewest significant figures already listed in the problem. And let me show you what I'm talking about here. For example, if we were working this problem 5.0 times 3.0, this 5.0 has two significant figures. This 3.0 has two significant figures. So there's not one with least number. They both have two. So that means our answer also has to have two significant figures. So out here, because it's not asking you to solve it, it's just asking you to tell how many significant figures your answer would need to be in, and we would say two. So I want you to go ahead and do the next three practice problems, and I also believe they're listed on your notes for you. So go ahead and do those. Pause the tape on your answer, and then resume the tape, or the video, once you're ready to check your answers. All right, I 
hope you got most, if not all, of those correct. If not, again, make sure you jot down your questions that you have or start the ones that you want us to go over, and we'll do that in class tomorrow. This concludes the video. I hope you have a great evening.